everyone, welcome to all our viewers joining us live on Facebook and on Zoom. We are so glad that you could join us for our second sesh in the second month of 2022, which is titled Reorganizing Exhibitions in the Asia Pacific Region, Transmitting the Philippine Experience in Anticipation of Post-Pandemic Museums. We are fortunate and honored to have Dr. Anna Labrador, Honorary Senior Fellow at the University of Melbourne as our speaker for today's sesh. During the sesh, we strongly encourage our Facebook viewers and Zoom attendees to pose questions to our speaker. By doing so, you will stand a chance to win a SPAFA souvenir as we will be choosing one winner from Facebook and one from Zoom at the end of the sesh based on the questions that you pose. For those on Facebook, you may leave your questions in the comment section under the Facebook live feed. And for those on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A tab. We will be announcing the winners at the end, so please do stay around till then. Moderating today's sesh is Simeo Spafa's director, Mrs. Somlak Charanput, who has extensive experience working in and with museums. Please join me in welcoming Director Somlak. Director Somlak, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our audience around the world. Thank you uh, once again for joining us in this February uh, SPAFA sesh. As you know that uh, this series of online activities aimed at practitioners and professionals interested in Southeast Asia's archaeology, heritage, and art, and also to everyone in these uh, who are interested in these fields to learn of new stories on the subject. We have uh, only entered 2022 for two months, but there are many things happening in the world that we live in today. We were and still are in the threat of pandemic, uh, but right now we are witnessing uh, another threat on our planet Earth that is the peace among nations uh, on Earth. As our organization is to focus on the preservation of culture and heritage, we are to keep on bringing our audience the knowledge and technical assistance to protect and prevent any impact that may occur to our heritage and culture. With that, uh, having said that, I would like to say that uh, our sesh today is planned to bring to you the story of how our cultural heritage is affected from a pandemic disaster and what kind of resilience were created by institutions like museums on this threat. And we are most honored to have just the perfect speaker uh, for this topic, Dr. Anna Labrador, a renowned museologist in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Dr. Anna, for accepting to be our speaker for today, Sesh, and thank you for staying up with us uh, in this hour for today. So before she begin, well, her talk will be on the reorganization uh, exhibitions, reorganizing exhibitions in the Asia Pacific region by transmitting the Philippine experience in anticipation of post pandemic museums to all of us today. I hope there are many museum colleagues uh, among our viewers today. So before she begins, let me introduce Dr. Anna Labrador to all of us. In fact, I don't think uh, you need that much introduction because all of us know you and all of the museum people around the world know you. But let me just say that right now, Dr. Labrador is Honorary Senior Fellow of the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies 
Faculty of Arts, University of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. Dr. Labrador is a social anthropologist and museologist by training, having obtained her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2000 and an MA in Museum and Gallery Management from the City, University of London in 1991. An academic before the MMP National Museum for Philippines, she taught for 20 year, 22 years at the University of the Philippines at Biliman and Ateneo de Manila University. So she has full of experience uh, in teaching and also in the field of uh, museologists and social, uh, social anthropologists. Uh, before and then and then after that she transferred to work in the, the National Museum of the Philippines and uh, right now has stepped down as a Deputy Director General for Museums at the NMP on December 1st, 2021. And that's why we just uh, learned of that. Uh, and I know myself that she told me that she's uh, moving to New York. I thought, well, she's leaving for New York. Why don't we just grab her and be our uh, speakers on this spa passage because she is too valuable for us to just leave her alone at this hour. Okay, so uh, she has been uh, working in the museum uh, for 10 years, responsible for research uh, development, museology, and technical assistance. Her role as chief curator and head of collections management was to make national collections and sites accessible to audiences in its three flagship museums in Manila and also another 15 museums in different parts of the country. So she is presently a member for the, of the International Council of Museums, Standing Committee for Museum Definition Prospects and Potentials, which is shaping a new definition for museum worldwide. worldwide. Uh, please pay attention to her uh, bio because at the end of this sesh, I will tell all of you what else we will ask her to do, okay? So uh, without much further ado, uh, may I uh, ask uh, Dr. Anna to please present her presentation today. Yeah. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kun Somlak. <laughs> I'll uh, turn on my, I'll share my screen first and so that we can see. Uh, can you see my presentation now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll do that. Um, so uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Sawadika uh, in Thailand and magandang umaga sa Pilipinas. I would like to show you some of the um, um, important Things matter to us, but I would like uh, before we start to um, express um, solidarity of the people of Ukraine and hope that uh, lives and their heritage uh, are going to be safe. Um, uh, of course, we've been reading online um, and in some of the newspapers that uh, Ukraine's museums are scrambling to protect their collection. And also because curators are also facing all these uh, obstacles no, as they protect their country's treasure. So this is a, a really nice uh, photo of uh, visitors viewing items from the War Childhood Museum on exhibit at the Kiev History Museum in Ukraine um, last June 22, 2021. So... Uh, Hopefully they're all uh, going to be safe. So I would like to show you what I'm going, I mean to talk to you uh, this, this morning. No? 
So I'll, I'll be introducing what this Asia Pacific region is all about, uh, where we're at, and then also give you a background on our experience to the crisis so far. And I hope that you will also um, kind of share yours uh, eventually uh, while, while I'm giving my talk. And um, the third part is um, to talk about museum collections and how we can keep uh, making them accessible. And then um, one of the ways of doing that is in number four, the strategies in making exhibitions. No? And then the fifth, of course, is the future. How do we fill our partially empty museums? Because um, even if um, we're, most museums are open, we can't really fill them in the way that we're, we were used to before the pandemic. So let me show you um, the map of uh, the Asia Pacific region. So there's really no definite kind of boundaries or sites depending, it's really, it really depends on the context. There's so much more for us to understand about our environments and people, as well as our anthropogenic activities, how we actually sometimes um, disturb our sites. No? We can, for instance, also examine practices, exchanges, um, and similarities in traditional and contemporary beliefs. Um, annual rights, for instance, or food or shelter, transportation, life cycle rituals in the region, among others. So as you can imagine, I will not be able to go through all the museums in this presentation. My estimate, as there are no clear data of the number, is that there are, there are around 4,800 museums in the Asia Pacific region. So I, I, I chose the ones I will present for their interesting programs and because I got involved in some of them. And I hope I can give you an idea of the, um, you know, the, the wide ranging and, and value of, of museums in our region. So this is uh, the profile. Um, it is a geopolitical rather than a cultural label, which maybe if we go beyond the geopolitical label, we can uh, maybe see a, a wider and richer uh, opportunity for us to, to study uh, the, the area. Um, there's no definite scope. Um, generally, it covers Southeast Asia, our region, East Asia, South Asia, Oceania, and the Russian Far East. And then um, there are quite a number of intergovernmental and non-governmental heritage organizations, such as, of course, CIMEO, um, ASEAN, ICOMOS, ICOM, ICROM, UNESCO, Asia Society, Traditional Textile Arts Society, or so Southeast Asia and others. And then um, the museum organizations and heritage conservation groups are also quite plenty. So there's the PIMA, or the Pacific Islanders Museum Association, the Common Commonwealth Association of Museums, um, ICOM ASPAC, which is the Asia Pacific uh, Regional um, Committee, the APCARN, uh, which I belong to, it's the um, it's it's a conservation group in the tropics and others. So. Um, it, it really, most of these heritage organizations cover training, survey, research, and conservation. It, it's really quite interesting for us to uh, get to know more about all these uh, organizations. And it's, a, it's another topic altogether. I would like to talk about what a museum is. And uh, since I'm in New York at the moment, I kind of want to, I remember this particular installation. It's, um, it's, it's by uh, Luis Kaminitzer. Uh, he's a Uruguayan artist and, um, and he likes doing all this installation art. He's uh, one of the more prominent Latin American conceptual artists. So what he did was he created this installation art on the Guggenheim, Solomon Guggenheim Museum. 
So the museum is a school. The artist learns to communicate. The public learns to make connections. So it's all about this access no, to, to collections. And we should really um, be more um, kind of aware of that, that part of museum work. So here is a more formal, um, it is the current definition, uh, official definition from the Inter International Council of Museums and one which will soon change. Um, we're aiming to respond to the need of, for a democratic and open process of consultation to the national committees, international committees, regional alliances, and affiliated organizations that constitute the International Council of Museums. So the standing committee for the museum definition formulated a new methodology going forward. And I'm part of this series of meetings. So the design of this methodology is based on a greater transparency as well as the careful listening to all proposals. So at this point, members of the, um, the, the, the committee has um, been given, we're at that point where we want to actually um, be able to present this for the um, general conference in Prague in August. So I hope that you can also participate. It's a hybrid conference where some people will be online and some people will be in uh, Prague. So I just want to show you uh, a series of images to just give you an idea of how rich the Asia Pacific region is. And here are some culture you know, to, to reflect the cultural diversity and also the biological diversity of the, our, our region. So and these are all from the UNESCO website. So this is a uh, kind of a humorous take on our experience so far, but it, it has kind of some kind of serious um, aspects to it. No? So, um, you know, when we were to told to keep our distance, to have our social distancing from each other, uh, we all scratched our heads, especially in the Philippines where 80% of Filipinos live in really small houses. So how to keep this social distance? No? But I'm, I, I would like to also open this opportunity for some of you. Um, perhaps you can see that we can do more studies on practices affected by the pandemic, words and concepts that could be collected and how they are perceived, for instance, with social distancing. So this is how the family took it. So there are museums, um, and then they posted this on, on their Facebook, of course. So that's uh, what they wanted to show, you know, how, how uh, they feel about social distancing. I mean, it's almost impossible. They're up to the rafters. So there are museums collecting already material culture of the pandemic, but we need to start collecting intangibles. For instance, stories, we need more stories. And I'm very curious about what, what these are. So in, in February 2021, uh, 2020, um, we still couldn't quite grasp this idea of what what the what COVID nineteen is all about, and um, while we were dissuaded to travel already at that time, uh, we insisted. We mean some some of my colleagues from the National Museum of the Philippines, an all girl team. Um, we were establishing our travel club because <laughs> we wanted to go around heritage sites. No? And this was around the, the time of the Singapore Biennale um, that started in the last quarter of 2019. And we wanted to, to, to see some of the sites of the uh, Biennale and also to see, of course, the National Gallery Singapore. Because I've seen uh, this gallery, the Southeast Asian Gallery, um, I wanted to show some of our 
of the women that I'm with who help in, for instance, sending some of the um, collections of the museum and the National Museum to uh, the National Gallery of Singapore. And it, you know, it's part of taking pride of and seeing it from the other side. No? And also I wanted to show them the installation art of Mark Hustiniani. This is the um, uh, uh, firewalk, which is an, you know, like this infinity mirrors uh, on them. You feel like you're going to drop in the, in the this this um, uh, the site. No, um, it's uh, it has all these archaeological materials in there, uh, reproductions, of course, and then it's kind of like uh, you feel fearful just walking through this uh, glass um, site. So it, it's it's also the experience of being there, but. As you can see, there were hardly any people around. That's February 15, 2022. So um, what was happening around the time, you know, we were kind of wanting to come to grips with what's, what's going on. But some of the organizations around us were very quick to actually respond to the pandemic. And for instance, British Council Manila, um, invited us to join this, um, I mean, you know, the National Museum to join the platform. No, um, this is the kind of responding to the the pandemic, you know, the COVID nineteen, but using art um, to to show how people feel about it, and um, they also wanted to share the the digital the collections of the British Council in digital form. So that I, I chose, for instance, uh, Lucian Freud's um, work. And uh, because this is how we were feeling at the time, no one really knew what's going on and yet we have to keep working. So, you know, I was installing an exhibition despite the fact that there were no visitors around because we had to close down on March uh, 13, 2020. And so um, this kind of encouraged the British Council. So we further developed the program um, together apart, but this is all, uh, the exhibition is not physical, it's all done uh, digitally. And we used Microsoft Sway to uh, put this together. So there are so many um, kind of instruments uh, um, software that we can use for different ways of um, conveying, you know, our ideas, our emotions, our opinions of what's happening. And this became really a big thing. Eventually, the online exhibition became much more of, you know, we, we got used to talking in boxes, where in bo this, this rectangles of, you know, um, trying to understand uh, what, what this is all about. And so we were, um, this particular um, program for the design week in November, 2020, um, you know, kind of talked across, um, like for instance, the artist, he's actually somewhere in Negros Oriental and he's, um, no, even that, uh, even his, his uh, connection was uh, on and off, you know, and, and that was, that's really kind of also uh, something to think about in terms of the digital divide um, that, that also, it, you know, it affects our region. You know? And so uh, the, the young woman uh, next to me is actually one of the curators of uh, the British Council uh, in, in London. So, so it's, it's an interesting take. And um, so I want to also show that one of the first kind of people that uh, organizations that began a series no, is of course uh, SPAFA. So this is the first SPAFA SESH, no, which is seminars, events, shows and how to's. No? And this is the first broadcast and it's uh, really focusing on um, uh, you know, houses that speak, you know, it's about the, um, the uh, houses in prey that's been uh, studied quite well by uh, SPAFA in, in the past. So it's a way of also going back to uh, all these research, all this knowledge and 
how, how do we, when did we generate all this knowledge, how do we manage them then? And museums can also be part of that um, knowledge management. India actually also sent us an email and said, um, you know, why not, um, you know, test our, our app and said they have this Hop on India app, which is really quite, quite also interesting. And that th those were the early days because it was sent uh, to me in June 2020. So it's also interesting. And then sometime in October, one of our uh, friends from the National Museum of Mongolia, who eventually transferred to the university, National University of Arts and Culture in Ulaanbaatar. Um, he, she, she, um, Sundev Enkarnan actually uh, talked about possible um, projects with ICTOP, which is the Training of Personnel Committee of the ICOM. And um, uh, just to show you that the National Museum of Mongolia was also closed during the time. So they were wanting to really find ways to um, make sure that they can, uh, you know, uh, put on a digital platform, the, for instance, the yurt, um, which is the traditional uh, house of nomadic Mongolians. So um, another example is uh, the museum in Sarawak. So, a, a number of museums that were actually um, in the middle of being upgraded or being built uh, uh, managed to take their time rather than you know all these manic uh, ways of uh, meeting the deadline. So the lockdown um, helped to plan or plan better um, programs. No, so. Um, according to the press release of the Sarawak Museum in Borneo, that, the, that it is the second largest museum of Southeast Asia. And that, um, so they announced their, the delay of their opening, but they, they still pursued their online program that was also delayed uh, from August 2020 to August 2021. In the Philippines, um, private art museums such as the Ayala Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, Manila also use the time to develop their upgraded museums and install more digital media um, as a feature. So just to show you, this is the inside of the uh, Sarawak Museum. Uh, it's multi-level, quite big. Um, so I, I would believe that it's the second largest. Um, so these are some of the uh, installations um, that are still uh, being put together. Um, so they also have uh, archaeology exhibitions and uh, all these uh, digital media um, where people can touch that screen that looks like a book. Uh, it's still closed, um, but just to show you that it's a lot of hard work um, planning exhibitions. So on level three, for instance, they wanted to show how indigenous peoples of Sarawak actually live uh, in harmony with nature. So it's, it's that, and they have focused on intangible heritage also. So just to show you all these uh, planning, you know, like you have to envision it when, you're, you're doing exhibition planning, um, you know, you have to pretty much get used to what is, you know, how large is a uh, 690 square meters. No? And, and usually that it, it helps when you walk around uh, the sites and so that you could also feel that you're in a, a space um, that is quite big. So, you know, with Sarawak's claim of being the second largest uh, museum, no? I actually searched for which is the, the, the largest museum in Southeast Asia. And I found out that it is the National Museum in Bangkok that's the largest uh, museum. And so, but since 2019, when I last visited in September 2019, we found out that, you know, really that upgrading has really been going on 
Um, so this is one of the the images no, of um, that visit, um, and also you know to look at how they use colors. Um, I like it because it's that's what I do also in my practice, no? and using existing space, which is quite difficult too. So um, I want to get, go into the third part of my talk, which is about uh, museum collections and access. And this is a, these are images of the museum boxes um, that we've put together. Um, we actually have the very first one that's uh, 10 boxes um, that features the um, biodiversity of Mindanao. And this is, uh, these boxes are um, the bio, on the biodiversity of uh, Visayas. And actually we managed to transfer them uh, to different schools and colleges until, of course, the pandemic happened and we had to um, um, stop and it got stuck uh, for over a year in one of the colleges in uh, Leyte. No? So it is now somewhere in Iloilo. We've managed to move them. Um, it visited Bohol on the way to Iloilo and so we're quite happy that uh, a lot more people uh, could gain access. So this is a combination of, um, uh, of reproduction and then uh, the turtle, for instance, is uh, an actual uh, spe specimen from our collection. So on um, March 13 to 2020, the National Museum announced that it will close to the public uh, because of COVID-19. So that, that was the first time we realized how serious it was um, because there was all these government uh, directives of how we should, um, we should uh, take care of our health also uh, to make sure that the collections are protected. So, um, you know, it's, it's really very strange because this is the Spoliarium Hall. Uh, that's a famous painting by uh, 19th century master Juan Luna. And uh, in any given day, this, uh, you know, during, before the pandemic, um, it, uh, this hall is almost always packed because it's a famous painting. And to see it on a Monday morning on the 16th of March, it was very strange to see no one there. Even if it is a time, uh, Mondays are usually, we were, were close to the public and um, that's when we uh, maintain our collections. But normally you would also have, for instance, um, other people coming in to clean um, um, the air, uh, air conditioning filters, uh, et cetera. So no one's around uh, except for a few of us uh, who comprise the skeleton uh, workforce. And uh, it was a bit eerie, actually. So this is in another building, the National Museum of Anthropology, and then the National Museum of Natural History. Even, uh, especially this particular museum in the Rizal Park area is almost always full. So it's quite, quite sad to just not have people like them. Uh, this was taken just a few weeks before um, the pandemic happened uh, when we, we shut down. And, um, you know, it's quite gratifying to always see uh, visitors being happy and interacting with our collections and activity areas. So we made sure that um, the museum, the galleries are well maintained, uh, always clean. Um, and uh, we didn't mind, um, you know, making sure that the air conditioning, um, the mechanical air conditioning is on because we needed to um, keep the temperature and humidity um, um, at, that, at a special level, um, depending on the need, needs of the collection there. We were also very mindful about security. And so we needed to make sure that um, we would um, be able to, um, you know, uh, keep everything intact. In um, 
and make sure no there's no threat of fires and you know um and and also uh theft no? so uh, the national museum actually looks after um these national collections and so we are regarded as custodians of the national heritage um, so we had to make sure that everything is safe so how do we count numbers how do we account for the museum's presence no um or presences so on site we usually look at, you know, how many visitors come in within the museum, um, you know, visits from, uh, from communities, um, look at the environments, you know, for instance, we're in the middle of, um, you know, very busy area of Manila. Um, so we need to make sure that, um, you know, we, we could also attract the visitors from that site. For off-site, um, there are traveling exhibitions. I showed you um, the museum boxes. Um, field research also is a way of uh, reaching out. Um, uh, workshops um, outside of the museums and uh, technical assistance. This last part, um, before the pandemic, we weren't very serious about it, the online one. In fact, um, the National Museum managed to upgrade its website only after um you know when when we were on lockdown um, because you know we had more time but also we didn't kind of really take too seriously our social media platforms and other forms of uh, digital access but during the pandemic that was the only way we could actually reach uh, more people and we started counting that so we also uh, managed to scan uh, a lot of the old publications because it was, you know, most of these publications were done before, um, you know, before the um, uh, all these digital kind of uh, layout and design happened, and so uh, this was all scanned and then put on a uh, format, and then we uh, then placed that in the on the website. So these are free um, publications. And then, um, you know, because we wanted to make sure that historical publications uh, are uh, available. So we launched this during the International Museum Day so, because there was a call for diversity and inclusion. And then we managed to also come out with uh, new publications, no? uh, such as this catalog of uh, this uh, artist, Ophelia, Ophelia Helvis on Teki, and then new monographs no, uh, about our collection and exhibitions. So it so when we started really taking seriously the um, the the social media platforms, we began a series uh, which is called the Museum from Home series, and. Um, it's a way of making the collection accessible. So this is uh, this fe particular feature happened on Friday. So that's hashtag um, Fossil Friday. And then uh, on on some occasions, like for instance, um, there would be a milestone like uh, National Food Month, and so we'd come out with uh, these objects, no, uh, from our collection, ethnographic collection, and it's uh, the coconut feeder. Um, that's from different parts of the Philippines. So it's quite interesting. So there were, as I mentioned, uh, all these mobile museum boxes that were being developed, but uh, this particular one is, um, you know, the, this um, uh, reproduction of the uh, Oton gold mask uh, will happen soon uh, around the heritage month uh, in may and it will feature all these um artifacts from um the area and and, and natural history of uh, panay island and there will only be five boxes and that would fit into a small village um um, um building no uh, like a, a hall no for for um uh, local government, uh, the tiniest kind of local government unit. And then so we had more of these uh, activity books. Uh, we had uh, coloring um, sheets. No? 
And then uh, by 2021, we kind of got gotten used to how to deal with the pandemic and how to use uh, online programs. So ASEM, which is the Asia Europe um, um, uh, organization, celebrated its 25th anniversary and uh, you know they they wanted to create um, a digital exhibition without physical a physical exhibition. So it's quite a, an interesting um, format, and we learned how to also see how all these differing software can affect uh, the way uh, one can present um, exhibitions, like um, three dimensional ones rather than rather than just flat ones. So this is an example of that uh, particular project with ASEM. So, uh, uh, and in fact, I was asked uh, if we actually sent out uh, these uh, objects and I said, no, it's all kind of done digitally with you know, like a 3D um, scan. So um, we planned um, an exhibition um, managing to borrow from uh, one of our Philippine consulates, actually from New York, um, 115 artworks that got caught out during the lockdown. And it took more than six months to bring it when you know, we were just expecting it to be less than a month to come to the Philippines. So this all came from New York and we had to uh, do a rapid assessment to see if well, it was uh, uh, six months in limbo, if something happened to them um, and that how we can address them. So we had a lot of discussions about how to, for instance, uh, see if the damage happened before the, um, uh, the, trans the, the transfer. No? Um, and uh, then we have to report all that. So a uh, one way of also um, putting across our, our uh, collections or even our knowledge no, was to you know, have like a live online program, sorry. So this was when the total lunar eclipse happened. And so we had, uh, we were broadcasting live from Rizal Park. No? That's our museum of natural history at the background. And, uh, an enormous lapu-lapu statue at the back. So it's quite quite romantic and interesting. And, and our, our staff in the regions um, were particularly um, interesting in the, their practice because they learned how to, I think more than us in Manila, no? how to actually address um, some of the issues about access. You know? And so this is their setup. You know, they're, they're really quite busy in the National Museum in Western Visayas in Iloilo. And uh, they also reached out to, you know, in, it's the, this kind of rethinking that we must keep doing in, in museums and heritage sites. So for, for most of their programs, they managed to um, uh, go, go to a special, you know, education school and uh, and they they have all these sign language interpreters during their their uh, broadcast of their particular program. So we also learned how to work with special photographers. And since um, this is that exhibition that where we did that rapid assessment, um, this is the Philippine Center in New York core collection of 1974, and. Um, I mean, if we have time later on, I can show you um, that link. Um, and it's a way for people who can't visit the museum to go around the exhibition. So we have a series of this. It's uh, available on the National Museum's website so that you can see um, what, what it's like. No, it's, it's very, very interesting um, because we've put in also information um, so you can just tap on them so that uh, if you want to read further about the artwork or the artist, it's also that. Uh, it's also in this project where we learned how to do, um, you know, the QR codes um, for, uh, because we didn't want to 
uh, put too much text um, and because we do uh, things bilingually and in the regions we have sometimes three languages also uh, besides Filipino and English so the local language is highlighted so we wanted to make sure that people have access to them even if they're the text is not um, in the exhibition itself so it's through the QR code so this is another special exhibition I'll, I'll show you towards the end um, a program because this is this was also delayed by COVID. Um, so I needed to make sure that, um, you know, because we we had to borrow quite a number of artworks and uh, we have to manage the exhibition such a way that the collectors can actually see the exhibition. So this is the um, uh, feature on the photo olio, which is a, these are photographs and hand colored because, um, of course, in the 19th and early 20th century, we still didn't have color for fee. So they were hand colored um, using oil paint. These are some of the series, and uh, I put down the link um, uh, in the bottom. So one of the strategies in making exhibitions, so we're on my, the fourth part of my talk. Um, so there are quite a number of uh, strategies. I mean, I think it's about writing out uh, the plan and making drawings and sometimes to um, get the interest of possible uh, viewers on your site um, if you're still on online um, it's it's to make them uh, kind of interactive and this is kind of not the digital um, form of interactivity you know it's it's more to do with color by number so it's uh, people can can download uh, coloring sheets like this and then they they can uh, read up about it because most of the time our the National Museum staff will include details about uh, this particular um, uh, artifact, for instance. So the National Museum, as I um, mentioned a while ago, it, it's not just in Manila, but all over the country. You now there are 15 museums. And um, you know what has been increasingly important for the museum was to reach out to a wider audience. That's why um, language, you know, for instance, the the type of language, the level of language, uh, what kind of information we bring out to, um, you know, to to the to, to viewers, to visitors, no, um, you know, what can they understand? Because it is uh, the job of uh, people in the museums to make sure that that exhibitions are also not just attractive, but also understandable. So one of the things that uh, we upgraded during the time of COVID was um, the 300 years of uh, maritime trade in the Philippines. No? And uh, because it wasn't so nice and so understandable. So instead of, um, the, the fear, of course, is not to make the exhibition look like an antique shop no? uh, where you can buy all these oriental ceramics, but to also put in, um, you know, information that has something to do with uh, how they were, uh, were taken from wreck sites. This one is in, the, in Marinduque, in the middle part of the Philippines, um, because they're has been extensive trading in the past and and uh, ships would pass through the islands no? so the philippines is quite uh, also fortunate like thailand to have uh, all these uh, wealth no so this is um uh, an example of the installation that we did but this is an interesting um, kind of experience because we couldn't travel during the time that was in uh, the um, uh, I think September 2020, when it's like August, September 2020. And so we wanted to make sure that it's it's done properly 
but we had to work with our contracted um, our contractors. No? So uh, it was really quite um, quite quite difficult, very tricky, and uh, but we managed to to do it quite uh, well. The space was, was small, so uh, and so it was done um, in a in a uh, uh, you know kind of a not 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 it didn't take too long to to do it um and the other side of that uh, exhibition was about the uh, morionan you know that's it's this uh usually it's a ritual done during the holy week um and it thought it's it's about a play a street play on uh the passion of christ and uh the morion is actually you know it's 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 a full-headed mask no? and and refers to some of the um you know the 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 roman romans um and uh so it's quite interesting that they've a lot of these uh costumes were done at home no? and it's also a very important um ritual uh where young boys uh, become you know, men, it's part of the rite of, um, um, of passage of, uh, of uh, the boy. So it's, it's uh, an interesting area. Um, we, we like that space and there's a, we managed to put in an activity area that was not used until very recently because the, even if we put together uh, all these exhibitions, um, it was still closed. So everything was on, online. One of the things that um, I think uh, we neglect in, uh, you know, given that we are so used to thinking about disasters as, you know, these short episodes, the very, um, very, you know, uh, something that, that happens in a given time, like, for instance, if we have a flood, then, you know, you kind of meet the challenge to make sure that the flood, uh, you know, gets drained away, and then we clean. But the pandemic is is a, as I refer to it, this is a, is a disaster like no other. And because uh, so we don't know, for instance, the long term effect of that, not just on the physical health, but actually the the mental health of the staff. No, and um, you know, this is another kind of discussion that we can have. Um, because um, some of the, the staff members also had to deal with kind of domestic issues. No? And so by November 2020, we pushed for funding from our gender and development um, budget and so that we could hire two psychologists to help uh, our staff through, uh, you know, what what they're experiencing. But uh, I think um, we should not, not forget about the importance of making sure that, um, that staff can actually do their jobs, but at the same time to look after their uh, well-being as well. I mean, if, if, if I could manage at the time when I was uh, still at the museum to get uh, funding for yoga and other rec relaxation techniques that would have been really better. <laughs> so that's a, another thing. So I'll just, sh I'll just show you some of the projects that uh, we managed outside of Manila. And uh, at this point, I was already able to travel. Um, that was in July um, 2021, and then also uh, uh, September, end of September 2021. And so Fort Pilar is an old, um, uh, you know, fortification, a Spanish uh, barracks no? that's been converted into the National Museum of uh, South, Western Southern Mindanao. So the idea was really, it's much, much delayed, uh, is to hang the um, lepa, which is a houseboat, um, that's common around the area of uh, the Sulu Sea. The Sulu Sea is also quite famous because the Tubata Harif, which is a world heritage site, is uh, that's where it is also located. So I, you know, I had all these 
ideas of this hanging uh, the lepa from the um, from the ceiling and then so that people can peer around while going through this this area so we took we had to take out a, a whole floor um, even before before the pandemic and then we just got, got kind of delayed by by all this um, concern so so we wanted to show the artistry even of the you know this wonderful fish nets um, in in our collection um, and then boats um, we didn't realize that there were more than three boats we were planning for just three boats there were actually 10 boats um, in the collection so and their their actual size so we're it's very lucky that um, there's enough space to accommodate them all and also the um, the tools of for making boats so because uh, uh, the Sama um, are actually quite famous for uh, their boat building capabilities and then we've managed to also rehash some of the old exhibitions um, and uh, because we had this wonderful um, team uh, of contractors who kind of understood why I don't want to waste something like this you know and because it was it has his, its own history as well. So we translated all these, um, you know, this is how in the 70s or 80s um, exhibitions look like, you know, uh, the labels. So we managed to translate that into a nicer uh, format. And um, it's important to also collect all these objects. In this exhibition, we had four languages. It's Bisaya, which is the lingua franca in the area. And then, of course, the um, uh, Chavacano, which is the pidgin language, um, um, you know, Creole language, uh, uh, Spanish Creole language. And then um, uh, Filipino and English, uh, which are all in QR codes. So what we have been miss missing is actually pre-pandemic, we had the opportunity to do uh, co-curation. Um, and uh, this, is, this was taken um, in, in May, I think, the, in the International Museum Day. Um, in 2016, I think 2017, and this is a, a group of Aitas. Um, you know, there's a, the, this particular indigenous groups that are are scattered all over the Philippines are uh, very much. They suffered through a lot of uh, discrimination because of the color of their skin and their their curly hair, and so they. Uh, it was really quite a nice opportunity to have worked with them and to recast um, the um, exhibition and to understand the collection. Um, and the other challenge that uh, you might also be having is, you know, how to do field work um, in the middle of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, because it's, we, we really don't know how, you know, the way, the um, pandemic or the COVID-19 is, is behaving, you know, there might be more variants. So the strategy was really, instead of sending staff from Manila, is to actually develop the regional sites and the regional partners. And in this case, the Northern Cebu Archaeological Project was funded by the Aboitis Foundation. So we found money for the activity but also to partner with the university on site. So it's quite, quite good. So these are some of the um, images, you know, immediately it's, um, the study is actually about the metal age in northern part of Cebu, which is in the middle part of uh, the Philippines. And to, to show how, you know, how uh, the metal age can be systematically uh, recorded, documented. So quite, quite interesting. And this was just on the first site um, in, in San Remigio. So uh, in, actually uh, in April, I will be returning to the Philippines to do field work um, 
um, I managed to actually it was my uh, PI, uh, the principal investigator. Um, um, so the who who has actually Andrea Jankowski. Uh, some of you may know her because she has actually done archaeology in Thailand and also the salt making process. This is salt from Bohol province in in Albuquerque town and it's actually baked in its own clay pot no so very very interesting and it's you know i mean we we could do much more about this because it's artisanal salt so that's uh, andrea cooking her salt <laughs> in one of those workshops so the british museum endangered uh, material knowledge um, program gave us uh, a little bit of money to do uh, this documentation and hopefully we could build a proper workshop for the uh, the artisanal salt makers. So, so other things that we really have to do is to reach out to more. We were surprised like this uh, group of young historians putting together because our, what, we, what we came up with in the National Museum, uh, everything that we publish is actually public domain. So they can pretty much do uh, these things like uh, put them on different digital platforms. So another thing that I wanted to, to discuss is like um, we, we had to actually create different ways of communicating with our, with our colleagues, no? because how do we move forward? So in October 2021, we were given actually funding by the ASEAN COCI. And, um, and, and uh, put together an online museum congress so that we could talk about exhibitions um, and other public programs, which is museum interpretation. And uh, given that there are a lot of challenges, like I mentioned a while ago, uh, the museum divide, in, I mean, the digital divide in museums, no? and not all museums uh, can have access to uh, digitization. So what do we do beyond that? So there's a long, long program, um, quite, quite uh, interesting three days. Um, uh, we uh, divided the program in such a way that, you know, the first, on the first day, the keynote speaker, um, who is um, Dr. Paul Michael Taylor of the Smithsonian, talked about this import, the importance of, you know, what could have been done before the pandemic. And um, so there were also special topics and also the uh, practitioners talked in the afternoon. On the second day, we talked about, um, you know, how people are responding to the pandemic. And, and day three was about, uh, you know, what do we do uh, having all these information and uh, some of the activities. So it's really quite a challenge, uh, but you know it's it's uh, my first time to actually run a a full museum conference um, with just very few people and all the machines uh, just out no, to broadcast. But we managed. You know, we even had a networking session in the evening. Talk about uh, um, you know. Uh, some other things that are beyond the program, the official program. But this is how the, the whole setup looked like. No? And we're coming out with the proceedings um, quite soon. And then there's a lot of reaching out to different groups. No? So for instance, uh, PIMA, the um, Pacific Islands Museum Association through Dr. Teresi Bonadilio, she actually approached me and um, said, you know, why don't you give a talk? And so there's been a, a series of talks. And the Fiji Museum have long wanted to actually do something more um, with, you know, their collection. So um, th this, you know, they use also their, the time when they're um, um, closed um, to reimagine their uh, museum. So. So they're different sites. So I, I gave them this idea that maybe they can talk about 
you know, going on a journey because uh, boats were really quite important also to the Fijians. So that's uh, a way of being. This is how the old museum set up. And I understand now that they're doing much more. They've been given funding by the U.S. Ambassador's Fund to, um, you know, to actually document their uh, very important collection. So, so it's really... Um, it's really quite nice and gratifying. And then um, Dr. Tarisi also does a lot of, you know, we, we, we have some sessions. And for me as a, a museum professional, it's very, very interesting what, what's out there, no? And I didn't realize that in Hilo, it's in an, uh, another island of Hawaii, that they have all these uh, materials, you know, like um, stone tools, no? That's not been properly recorded so we've been talking about you know how important uh, this um, this uh, mountain in in Hilo is for a lot of people and uh, and how to actually um, fix up the Mount uh, Manukea, Manukea um, um, visitor information uh, center so one, one of the things that, you know, I, I ask myself, besides, um, for instance, um, you know, why are all these things here? <laughs> like, in, you know, in terms of collection, what are they doing in the museum? I also ask, you know, what, what is the museum um, for? Who is for the museum for? You know? Museums for whom? And I kind of am attached to Paulo Freire's um, education uh, you know pedagogy of the oppressed you know and because it, it you know through my practice I've noticed that it's really quite important to think in terms of you know the um, human beings not only to be present but to be part of it and that's why we need to develop all these different programs that are more interactive, that, you know, values um, the ideas you know, of, uh, of a, a lot of people. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to know all these requisites and competencies, but at the end of the day, you have to translate that, make sure that museums become, you know, sites for interaction, they become portals of knowledge, they become, um, you know, like, like, a, you know, a takeoff point for something much more important to the community. So, so I want to kind of suggest I'm going getting towards the end of my, my talk, no, that, um, you know, the, uh, it's important that community members you know, have practices of protecting what is theirs, you know, and that's why we need to co-curate with uh, community members and those that they could share. You know, we must be aware that not everything is for display of what they have. Um, we also need something like a legal framework and financial support to be able to establish museums. Um, but we have to also learn to share decisions. So it's really this notion of, uh, you know, creating democratic spaces. So in the Philippines, for instance, it's important to take note that, um, you know, this, this divisions of people, they always call them tribes, but that's the uh, early American anthropologists uh, talking because they, their framework is actually from from you know the Native Americans, uh, the, the the local indigenous groups in in the U.S., but there's no such thing in the Philippines. Um, instead of tribes, they have to be to use a certain type of village identification scheme, and um, so that's why there's a lot of resistance to the national narratives that we give uh, to them. You know, uh, especially people like us in the academe, you know, the people who are considered gatekeepers. You know, we have to really kind of relax our, our hold on um, these certain 
um, aspects of how we can get them more involved. No? So we need to also uh, encourage young people to participate in uh, you know, traditional practices so that uh, you know, they will, it may attract interrogation, dialogue, and quite possibly you know, renewal of practices. In my own practice as an anthropologist, I've seen how, for instance, the area that I worked in for my, my PhD thesis, uh, dissertation uh, in Bontoc Mountain Province, in the beginning, they were so embarrassed about you know, their traditional clothes and all that. But it's, it's fun to see them kind of being proud now of who they are and you know, even wearing voluntarily their clothes rather than you know, being forced to in the past so that they can be displayed. So, so there's, a, there's a change. And um, I think it's, it's not because of us, but because it's this assertion of who they can be and how, you know, how we represent them in museums and certain heritage sites. So um, finally, you know, also these non-interventionist interests from outsiders may bring positive re-evaluation of formerly denigrated practices. So there's this self-consciousness that develops because of that, the kind of interest that we, we can express. No? So it's, it's really, really quite good. I mean, you had, you had Marlon Martin and Stephen Abado giving, giving that talk. Uh, I think that's the third um, Spafa sesh or a second. And it's, it's really, really, really very important um, that you, you know, that you, we, we develop that kind of self-consciousness among us because, you know, like Marlon Martin, who's a Ifugao, he can pretty much talk uh, for himself, no, not us. No. Um, so I just want to share some images with you. Um, you know, we miss this kind of interaction. We can't have this anymore. Um, but really, uh, there's so much um, in terms of what we can still do. Um, and we need to move on. And so um, for our Asia Pacific colleagues, um, what we have to think about is that conservation in the midst of disaster prone nations, especially island nations is very, very important. And we need to do the groundwork even before another uh, pandemic happens, no, another, because it's, it's all this idea of making sure that our collections are also safe so that people will remember um, who they are and where they come from. Um, intangible heritage is also becoming much more important uh, over tangible uh, and material culture. And that's why we need to document how these things are made and the stories that go with them. I'm a full subscriber of co-curation, which is a better way forward for most of our programs. Um, we still haven't accounted for the social burden of the pandemic to our human resource. Um, you know, there's a lot more people who are leaving uh, museum and heritage work and, you know, focusing more on their families, especially if they lost members of their families. Um, so there's also security in the safety of people and collections. So that has to go uh, together. So both intangible and tangible aspects are very, very important. If someone who's very knowledgeable dies of uh, COVID-19, you know, and then that knowledge has not been documented, how do we um, deal with that? No? And then the access to collections um, and experience no, to digital platforms, um, uh, hopefully we could find other ways no, of making sure that that uh, uh, is possible no? um, and uh, we can we can record them even even on you know analog formats no? so just to show you how we build that up you, that photo all, all your exhibition because we sometimes didn't see each other no? and it's it's the intangible that was really quite important in this project 
So we did a lot of digital rend rendering of the collection um, on to, to be displayed and how they might look all together. And this is, you know, some of the things that we did. Um, we had a group chat. We talked about this. We also recycled. Uh, we learned how to recycle uh, materials because there was none available at the early, you know, in the in in 2020. Uh, most of the um, shops were closed um, for materials. We did a lot of mock-ups using, you know, the size of the paper is the size of the artworks. Uh, we depended a lot on, for instance, this drawings like this, the floor plan, and we left them on the, the site so uh, they, that can be seen by the other team that comes in because, because we were going to work alter, on alternate days. Um, so finally, this is how it looks. Um, it's quite nice. It's uh, one of those photo olay that's like a decoupage where you know you have you put the pictures on the shaped wood and it creates this 3D effect. Um, I also had this idea that we can use the posts because they were like quite eye um, to dress them up and so that we can put all these images from you know studio photography um, in the early 20th century. And so this is how it now looks. Yeah, I, sh I was showing a visitor how uh, it looked like. So that's the, the, um, the um, introduction to uh, that particular exhibition. So um, just uh, to, to let you know that um, there is also the International Museum Day and I really like the theme, the power of museums. But I think the power of museums can only happen when we involve uh, as many people as possible. We network, we reach out, uh, we see our pro programs as a, a very humbling experience because we don't have the, the knowledge of everything. So we have to share and, and consult and uh, converse. <laughs> So thank you so much. Maraming pong salamat sa inyong pakikinig. Here's my email uh, address in, in case you want to get in touch and if you want to read much more of what I've written on the topic. So thank you. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah. Anna. Uh, there are quite a few questions posting for you. I, oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, what, uh, stop you during the talk because oh, sorry. I was trying <laughs> to uh, listen uh, to all the talk that you try to present. But uh, this question is from me before I go to others. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you mentioned that uh, you, the museum started to, if I understood right, uh, that uh, you started to collect the tangible uh, collection during the pandemic. Am I right? No, not us. Actually, it's it's more of the other museums. Um, you know, like uh, the Smithsonian, for instance, have uh, mm -hmm. all these collections from there, but not not so much us. It's uh, our, in our in our case, it's more the uh, the activities, the programs that uh, because we, in a way, we, we we're making history in that sense. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's it. that's also very interesting that mm. uh, what you are saying. But the, mm. the reason I ask you this because we used to have one speaker from Japan, and yeah. probably you know him, Kenny yes. Satomi. Yeah, I, I think I, I listened to his talk. One yeah, time. and so he tried uh, to collect some of the, the collections from the uh, period of pandemic. But what I uh, listened to you is that you are saying that the collection is a collection, but without the anti intangible uh, heritage behind it, sometimes it's not... Uh, I mean, we might miss that yes. because we are focusing more on the collection and forgot That's to right. say, oh, what about this collection that 
can tell us about the the period of pandemic. So yes, I was, exactly. Uh, and I was uh, probably I thought, oh, the Philippines already did that. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I thought <laughs> it might be a good uh, thing that many of the museum in the our region, Asia and Pacific, starting. To, to do, yes. but the way yeah. doing with the, the activities, uh, historical period of this moment is also yes. quite interesting. Yes. Let me go to our viewers' uh, questions. Uh, one is from uh, Karta Ivankov. Uh, the question goes, have you thought of a Southeast Asian collaboration between museums in different countries, sharing this knowledge in a practical way, exchanging experiences, and maybe collaborating in the future for common projects. Yes, uh, are you, is she referring to um, uh, the pandemic? Uh, I'm, I'm, or? I thought that she meant about the information that you are presenting it now mm. and uh, mm. probably uh, if we can this is my first first mm. thought that if we could probably sharing more collect i i thought of as uh as Papa. probably mm. this is a uh, one platform that we could collect uh, some experience among the museums in Southeast Asia and you know put it into a more uh, how do you say concrete uh, platform uh, yeah. for everybody to come in and see and share mm -hmm. and probably try on their own way. But yes. I'm not so sure either that yes. uh, that's the way she wants it because at the end she said in the future for common projects. Yes. Well, we were coming out with the proceedings of that ASEAN Congress mm -hmm. and perhaps that could start uh, people to think about um, more concrete terms, you know, how to, to deal with that. Um, it, it's very hard to tell because we're still in the middle of the pandemic and we want to keep pushing forward our governments want to get past this but um, you know we all have to do our share and uh, make sure that we all um, get vaccinated for instance and uh, you know keep to the, the health protocols but yes definitely um, it, I think it's also important for people's well-being to start thinking of you know you know post-pandemic scenario so that that could be another way yeah definitely we had a lot of our southeast asian programs um stop you know because of the pandemic and so you know it's been very frustrating that way all right i think uh, i i also am very interested in your ASEAN Museum Congress. Yes. So we're ho hoping to, to come out with the publication by April. So oh, good, good, yeah. good. Because yeah. I like uh -huh. to, <laughs> to hear more about museum interpretation in times of uh, disaster. disaster. Right. Yes. That's, that's a, a, one interesting uh, uh, topic. Well, mm. another question is from Kartika uh, from Indonesia. Uh, actually, she has two questions. Okay. The first one is that, what are the obstacles faced by the museum during a pandemic? <laughs> a lot. Um, I think it's that also you, the consideration of uh, the staff um, me, uh, mental and physical well-being um, is one because People are scared, and um, that affects the way they work. Um, it's it's not it's not a normal time. Um, not many people fared very well and are faring very well with the pandemic. Um, and I think that's a consideration for a lot of our organizations. Um, we need to study further um, how, for instance, that as I mentioned towards the end, the social burden 
of uh, museums. But, you know, we're human beings and we are creative and we find ways. Um, and, you know, I showed you that uh, despite the challenges of putting together exhibitions, because mm. in our case, we need to do physical exhibitions before we can translate that to, uh, um, you know, to the actual, to, to digital format. Um, because it just makes more sense for us to uh, see that in, in the future, like now, um, museums are open again. And so, and it might also help the public's well being to be able to go to, uh, you know, to a heritage site and, um, you know, um, kind of deal with some things that, you know, might be important to them in terms of, um, you know, associating themselves with, with objects that talk mm -hmm. about their, or sites that talk about their um, identities. No? So, so there are plenty, plenty of, um, you know, um, kind of challenges. But, but I think the one thing that's often um, ignored is the, is, is the well-being of uh, staff. And that, you know, we should look after um, ourselves first before we think about, you know, being able to go out there in the public. Because I think in some, some cases, there are um, occasions where, where even the staff, they're scared of, uh, you know, possibly contracting the, the, the COVID-19. So you know, what to do uh, given that. So there should be um, a kind of, you know, constant dialogue about uh, programs. I mean, like, we talk about maybe like here in New York, they're saying that by Wednesday, children can go to school without masks, but parents are, are very apprehensive, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the same way in, in, in the National Museum um, last year, um, you know, we've opened, uh, you know, you just have to, to book and, but, but normally, even if they book, um, only a quarter or one third uh, actually come to the museum because there are there so many other factors. So what, what to do with that? No? I mean, you have, you've opened and finally it's there, but it's another way of, uh, you know, finding ways to, to get them, um, um, make, make the museum accessible. And so, so maybe it will be more of a hybrid um, way. Uh, maybe it's going to be, uh, you know, both digital and physical. And so, so it depends, I think, in the context of your own museum or heritage site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh... I, I also think along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from Kritika uh, also. She said that uh, the museum collection is, well, I, uh, what she meant, I, I have to uh, translate her question. She said whether the museum collection is always plus its collection and change its placement for variations. I think what she meant is uh, to change more of the exhibitions for var variations. For yes, mm. actually that makes sense. I mean, even in from a conservation, uh, especially if like you're putting exhibitions of like, um, like textiles or mm -hmm. uh, more, more organic uh, objects that are made of organic materials. And so, you know, textile exhibitions need to be, um, you know, uh, changed every so often so that the, the textile can actually rest and uh, uh, find another group. So that's, that could be like uh, part of a program. It could be thematic. Um, it's the same for mats and baskets and and all that mm -hmm. so 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 i think it makes sense to to be able to do that and then to um engage in you know kind of communities that produce them and and present a much more contemporary uh representation because because uh 
in most cases, like for instance, in most national museums, it's all these historical objects. No? And maybe, you know, having something like a um, artist residency program will be uh, beneficial because the artist can respond to uh, historical collections. So, you know, it's one way of also uh, upgrading the, the mm -hmm. exhibitions. No? Yeah. I'm sure that uh, <laughs> many people have many other questions, even for uh, me, but uh, I'm so overwhelmed with your talk. <laughs> 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 no, that uh, I, I probably uh, behind the scene, I might uh, get in touch with you for more questions, but sure. I, I'm just thinking that, uh, the first uh, reaction of every museum uh, during the pandemic is to go online. And everybody yes. is talking about the uh, virtual tour. Yes. So I'm trying to think about that. Had any of the museum, uh, how do you say? Uh, I can name. Uh, uh, had any of them thought of the the success of the mm -hmm. virtual exhibition uh, yeah. or not? Because, like you are saying about the psychological uh, uh, mind of mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. not just the staff, but everyone. Yeah. Are they going to pay attention to our virtual tour? Uh, I mean, we, we thought that these might help them, but mm -hmm. probably there are more things uh, in, uh, in their mind uh, yeah. uh, to look, to think about, not just our uh, virtual exhibition. So probably there might be some uh, other aspect that we might uh, add to our virtual exhibition uh, mm -hmm. for that. I like the idea that you talking about psychological, uh, did you really yeah. uh, hire psychologists? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and, and the wonderful thing is that some of our staff members, especially in the regions, they've learned how to do group therapy. Uh -huh. And that's kind of kind of resolve some of their issues even before the pandemic, because mm. they've learned to talk with each other. Mm. Um, I think in the past, it's also a cultural thing. Um, uh, in general, Filipinos are non-confrontational, mm. and so they, you know, we we usually just uh, leave the area and and you know talk behind the person's. <laughs> Back and so that's, I think that's <laughs> normal attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So so um so I think it's it's that it's um uh, uh, learning to talk with each other is really a fine art. Um, people should kind of uh, go through without without anger, you know, without uh, resentment, because there's also this tendency to take uh, take um, it out on on other people your anger on other people and so it's 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 what I'm talking about in the sense that we we really need to look after staff we need to also you know create a, a more caring ethos in that sense because mm -hmm. uh, it's this is how to go forward with the pandemic it's it's going to be around for a long time. We don't know the long-term impact of those who have had it, you know, and things like that. So, so it's like um, how I go about, you know, like relating with people. I just treat everyone as special, <laughs> you know, so, so that so that I don't get into trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it's that. I it's it's really a um, for me it's kind of um, a success that we managed to hire psychologists. And those psychologists, they can just call, um, you know, on their, their mobile phones um, if, you know, they need to talk. 
Um, and there are some uh, sessions where they can uh, be in appointments. They can they can go on appointments. Um, you know, especially in the early days of the pandemic, um, they we, they can't do the face to face thing. So it's 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 not you know. So it's well, just a matter of managing. <laughs> That's a very great idea because the psychologists are not only for staff, us too, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Especially. <laughs> uh, it's useful. It's useful to have religion also because right. you know if you can't can't get past a certain thing, you can always pray. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> prayer is energy, right. so right. that's useful. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. my last question uh, is, uh, you just mentioned about curation and all that. You mentioned about the word code curating. Can you yes. ex expand a little bit on that? Yes, so it, it takes much more time, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's a matter of, um, in a way, dismantling that kind of power that, that you know, uh, specialists um, have always had um, because I mean if if you look at the practical stuff like for instance we have we have so many things in the collection but because they were not properly labeled they were not properly documented if you know the, the whole process of recontextualizing uh, recasting reconnecting with the objects etc needs really um kind of experts from the source community i mean that's a way of it's not just about exhibitions it's about objects uh, even historical objects how you can um, you know contemporize it for you know uh, the 21st century how would people uh, understand it especially if the um, museum is funded by taxpayers i think we always have to think about those things um you know that's why i said sometimes i ask myself why are these objects here what were you know mm. what were the reasons behind that and so you know the lack of provenance is actually a good starting point um we've had that experience with uh, the Lu some Lumad groups from Mindanao, they're the non-Muslim groups, you know, because some of the objects, we don't know what they're for. They're just there. But, you know, because we're a national museum, so we can't uh, just dispose of them, you know, and things like that. So, so it's, you know, it's so interesting because we, you know, certain people can talk about the technology of making them, the technology of actually um, using them, you know, and sometimes the simplest kind of objects have so much. And then again, that's the story. I mean, the, the story would come from that. I, I my experience as an anthropologist, um, you know, like now I'm reviewing what I've done, you know, really 20 years ago for my dissertation. And I got so many things wrong. <laughs> so, oh. so, 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 you know, um, because sometimes the, the data that you gathered, you know, is, is really time bound. And sometimes it's about other people's interpretation of things, you know. And then, you know, sometimes I get, I get sworn at by by you know the old people and say you know you're really a stupid girl. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> so it's I interesting to go, to go through I that. Also, <laughs> I also heard about the uh, American Indian collection in some of the uh, museums in the states also that. Uh, they were blamed also and you know yeah. uh, complained from yes. uh, Native yeah. Indian about uh, that's that, that's why co-curation is so important because right. you know it's right. like it's it's really co-authorship um, and so that you know you I don't all you know for instance as a as so-called specialist I don't have the whole burden of you know exactly. being the the sole explainer. Mm -hmm. of that so but, it's interesting. well i mean people are talking more and more about community 
involved. Yes. But yes. Uh, this, I asked you this, and you mentioned this is uh, another aspect that I would like the museum people to to look at this community yeah. of it's not just their support for having a museum or yeah. other things but the identity yeah. from them also yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, living heritage or uh, intangible yes. heritage from yes. them and, yeah. and and that's why uh Sinus papa is also uh, gonna uh, what uh, organize uh, another project on the ethics but yes. these type of ethics are not mm -hmm. only for legal uh, way of looking mm -hmm. at the, the ex excavation only, but yeah. the you know the, the whole thing about ethics uh, comes yes. to the, the native uh, people who own mm -hmm. the collection. Yes. So, oh, yes. another another big issue is repatriation. I think right. in a lot in a lot of cases, um, you know the collecting institution um, kind of things that just by returning that solves all the problems but it ju it's just really a start um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you know and and it has all these other things uh, attached to it that uh, becomes an, an issue uh, <laughs> for the community that that uh, is the recipient of the repatriation so it's an interesting area you know and uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and go on and on and on with me. <laughs> That's well, true. Uh, we, we, I think we're closing to the end of our time. So i like to thank you very much, Anna. Yes. Dr. Anna yeah. Labrador. Yeah. Yes. To, to uh, presenting this very informative and inspiring presentation for all of our museum colleagues and also other people who are interested in the cultural heritage. And I, who knows, we might be able, uh, having more and more about uh, the risk, yes. different risk that uh, we have to prepare. We're talking about, many people talk about post pandemic and yeah. you know, uh, after the pandemic, there are still more and more of things that we need to talk about. So, uh, I, ladies and gentlemen, museum colleagues who are in the audience, as I mentioned in my introduction, that Dr. Anna is one of the renowned museologists in Asia and Pacific. Therefore, I have asked her to be our speaker on the SESH series topic on museum. So be sure to follow us in April on the 11th on the topic of celebrating International Museum Day uh, 2022 in uh, Southeast Asia, the power of museums and its meanings uh, for the museums in the region. So that is the preparation for all of the museums in uh, Asia, uh, Southeast Asia and Pacific. Uh, to prepare for your International Museum Day in your museum, okay? And further uh, than the, in the April, she will be back on July 25th on the topic of a new museum definition, ICOM, and its visual role in Southeast Asia. As uh, I mentioned before, that she is in the committee uh, for that. So that will be a uh, very uh, in detail uh, for all of us in uh, Asia and Pacific museums. So thank you very much, Anna. Uh, thank you. Really enjoyable. And, and uh, thank you once again and see you in April. I like to give the floor back to you, John, please. Thank you, Director. And thank you. Dr. Anna Labrador for a very insightful spa sesh today. It was really great to learn the innovative ways that the National Museum of the Philippines um, overcame the pandemic to reach the people in spite of the obstacles faced. Uh, we are truly grateful to Dr. Anna for being part of our sesh, especially 
with the 12 hour difference. So it is nearly midnight for her in New York. And to our viewers, thank you for joining us and participating with your questions to Dr. Anna. I have the names of our winners based on the questions received and our lucky winners are from Facebook, Kata Ivankov, who is based in Indonesia, and from Zoom, Kartika, also from Indonesia. We will be in contact with you both shortly about mailing your prize to you. And if you would like to watch this sesh again, there will be a recording immediately on SPAFA's Facebook page at the end of this sesh. And we also post all our SPAFA seshes, including this one on SPAFA's YouTube channel. Just look for the SPAFA sesh playlist. And we have posted an evaluation link and we would really appreciate it if you could share your thoughts based on today's sesh, which will help us improve future SPAFA sessions. So till then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Anna, and thank you, Mrs. Somlak. We hope to see you in our next sesh. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>